Just a quick overview. I'll actually be starting introduction of carbon markets at a very high level. It helps folks to understand the context that carbon markets fit into, why they exist, why they're being proposed as a policy solution, uh, and contextualize them in, in terms of sort of how they fit in the greater uh, economics per, uh, perspective. Uh, and I'll be framing that in terms of ecological economics. Uh, so I'll introduce some, some uh, carbon economics context and definitions to help understand sort of how it fits together, some of the language that's being used. Uh, I'll do a quick introduction to pollution control economics in general, which actually includes one graph. Uh, so I apologize for those folks who are going to feel as though it's a flashback to, uh, to courses in college that you might not have enjoyed so much, and I'll make it as painless as possible. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's helpful to understand why carbon markets are being proposed, how they relate to carbon taxes, uh, and, and get into some of the discussion of the policy context there. I'll introduce the, the international climate treaties that exist that are setting precedents for carbon markets around the world and, and a few of the categories of carbon markets before getting into the details of voluntary markets, carbon offset projects, where we'll discuss uh, the biotic uh, carbon projects and are what are often called natural climate solutions and soil carbon, as well as uh, uh, other carbon carbon projects that are uh, prominent in markets. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about Regen Network and our program with the Carbon Plus credit that, that we're offering. Let me emphasize that questions and discussions are welcome throughout. So if it seems as though something's confusing or I've, I've gone through something a little bit too quickly, um, feel free to let me know. What questions do you have about the agenda before we get started? We can test out that discussion question asking if anything is a burning question at this stage. Okay, great. So just getting started, especially in light of the land acknowledgement, I wanted to start with a framing, a different framing of what economics is. In, in ecological economics, we really look at, as I mentioned in my bio, uh, the, the triple bottom line or, or aspects of economics that are not just related to economics themselves, but also uh, the relationship we have in a social context with the people around us in our community, our organizations and our families, uh, and also then our connection with the planet. And so the triple bottom line uh, and a lot of what ecological economics focuses on is the interrelationship between people, the planet and prosperity, or, or some people would say profits, uh, but it's all rooted in our relationship with the land. And so that's why I appreciate the acknowledgement of the land, our sense of place and indigenous peoples to start us off. The word economics comes from a Greek derivation. The beginning uh, is rooted in the Greek word oikos, which refers to home at three different levels, home being our family, uh, the land that our family lives on or works with, and then also the house that we live in. And so oikos, the Greek word oikos, refers to the interrelationship between home at those three different levels. And then nomos refers to management. So economics is literally the management of the home because when economics as a science originated, the home was the primary unit of economic organization. Uh, all work was done out of the home and craftspeople or farmers or fishers were working out of a home center before we divided the world into civil and domestic worlds. So from ecological economics perspective, we like to always start from this notion that economics is rooted in uh, where we live, how we interact with our family, our communities, the people around us, the place around us, and everything we have in the economy arises out of that foundation. Ecosystem services provide a context to understand um, a broader, more diverse aspect of how carbon markets fit into these dynamics. And you can see by all these uh, all these brown arrows that there's this very complex and diverse relationship between ecosystem services and constituents of human well-being. So in ecological economics, we often refer to about 27 different types of ecosystem services. Uh, they are roughly divided into supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural functions. Carbon markets exist as only one of these uh, categories. So it, it, uh, carbon markets function in the climate regulation aspect of ecosystem services, but it's important to understand that we receive all different types of services from 
the natural world in terms of stabilizing the climate, protecting us from disasters like flood, uh, providing food and water for us, uh, as well as the intrinsic processes of nutrient cycling, soil formation, and then also cultural dynamics, uh, aesthetic value we get from nature, the spiritual significance of, of nature in our lives, educational and recreational. So I always like to- you, Cause it sounds like um, there's a graph not showing up. Uh-oh. Is this, are you seeing the slide? Let's start there. Yes, seeing the slide, I see ecosystem services and a lot of arrows. Oh. Debbie, is that what you're seeing? No. Are we, are we seeing the green boxes in green the center? Boxes. Yes, yeah. I can see green boxes. And blue boxes on the right. Blue boxes, yes, is that, that's what we're looking for? I, I see it now. Great. I was just seeing only him. Oh, oh okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, thank you. I yeah, might, thanks. Yeah, let me um, unspotlight you. That might be the problem. Okay, thank you. Keep going. And do I have a, oop, is there a pointer at all? Do you know? Oh, I pointed things. That's, that's I'll look for it in the background as, as we're going. <laughs> no. We can, we can see, James, your, um, the arrow? your cursor. Oh, the yeah. arrow. Oh, yeah. Thank excellent. You. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. that'll, that'll serve to point a little bit. So um, we mentioned the context of carbon markets as in climate regulation. I feel it's most significant because there are other ecosystem service markets around the world in different places. There are markets for biodiversity protection and habitat, uh, for water supply, for water quality, for nutrient cycling, for flood protection. Some of these are market mechanisms. Some of these are payment systems that uh, give the ability to pay for, protect, and therefore support ecosystem services uh, that aren't market mechanisms. So it's, it's just important to understand that carbon markets are one. And sort of in the long-term vision, we're certainly hoping from an ecological economics perspective that there will be a greater involvement of the economy investing in the value of all of these services and the benefits that they provide for human well-being. Um, carbon is certainly one. It's one of the most tangible uh, that we're taking action with uh, initially, but it's, it's integrally connected to all these other ecosystem services. And it's important that we, we actually pay for these free services, or at least invest in the, the benefit of these services that we receive from nature. What questions are there about ecosystem services before I move on from there? Okay, we can always come back. I really like to introduce for folks understanding carbon markets, the notion of carbon existing in three different domains. This is a uh, uh, categorization system developed by uh, William Mc, uh, Bill McDonough, I wanna say, if I have my reference right, yep. Uh, who's an architect and so it's important to remember that uh, carbon exists in a lot of different layers in our world. Uh, we're certainly focused on the challenges of too much carbon in the atmosphere, which is the domain of what we would call fugitive carbon. And we want to pull that carbon out of the atmosphere and reduce the amount that we're emitting into the atmosphere so that we can stabilize the climate. And the two realms where we can move that carbon into to, so that it's not uh, causing problems for climate regulation is in durable carbon forms or living carbon forms. Durable carbon forms would be pulling it out of the atmosphere with technological means, putting it into different fibers or hard products that we can use uh, and make things out of so that the carbon's stored for a long period of time. Living carbon then is, is uh, actually cultivating the land and uh, the biotic, biotic world in a way that the carbon is taken out, out of the atmosphere and kept in the natural systems and that stock of living carbon. So it's important to look at carbon, not just as atmospheric, uh, but, but these three different dynamics. And the carbon markets are generally oriented towards uh, more so fugitive carbon and durable carbon and how energy uh, works in those, in those dynamics. 
really it's only in the last few years um, and uh, that we're realizing the significance of living carbon and, and the sheer scale that we need to be working with living carbon stocks other than uh, reduced emissions from, from deforestation and degradation on the forestry side. It's a relatively new concept and, and one of the biggest areas of innovation is agricultural soil carbon on the living carbon side. When we're looking at uh, carbon greenhouse gas emissions or carbon emissions, there's a very complex system of carbon accounting that happens in different organizations and at different scales. And so you'll often hear people referring to scopes one, two, and three or indirect and direct emissions. What those refer to are the ways in which uh, carbon is being em emitted in terms of the, the actual activities of an entity. So if I have a company and I am, uh, for example, um, burning fuel uh, in, from that company, well, that would, that would constitute my scope one emissions. I'm directly causing carbon to go into the atmosphere through my activities. If I'm getting electricity from the grid then, I'm not actually directly causing that carbon to go into the atmosphere, but indirectly I am. The electricity I use is in many cases being produced by coal that's burned at a power plant, while it's another entity that is an indirect, or in this case, a scope two emission that I'm causing to be emitted. And then also in the supply chain, if I buy paper or materials to make my products or computers, there are emissions that are resulting from the manufacturing of those, those goods and, and all the services that we use. So that refers to what are called scope three emissions, which is also another indirect category of emissions. So when we're looking at carbon, uh, the regulation, the accounting and, and the offsetting uh, is always categorized through carbon accounting that divides it into at the entity scale, scopes one, two and three, or if we're creating offsets, say I'm changing my farming practices or I'm changing my cattle grazing practices, then at the project scale, creating offsets for the carbon market, uh, I would I would categorize emissions or reduced emissions into direct or indirect. So fasten your seatbelts. This is the one graph as an economist that I feel obligated to show you. Um, this is a very brief introduction to pollution control economics and bear with me. I just want to introduce it so that people can understand why carbon markets exist why they're seen as one of the best solutions, but also then the limitations of carbon markets and how other uh, methods for pollution control might work better. If we look at this graph and, and say that uh, an entity or a community is emitting pollution, let's say for example, that we're emitting pollution at this level right here on the right in the red. When we're looking at the economics of pollution control, what we wanna do is we wanna compare what's called the abatement cost and the social cost of that carbon. So the abatement cost is how much would it cost me to not pollute each unit of, or not emit each, each unit of carbon. The social cost then would be what is the cost to society, society and also the environment of each unit of pollution. So at these high levels of pollution on the right-hand side of the graph, we would see that the cost to society and the environment for these units of pollution is actually greater than the cost to me to abate or, or stop that pollution. So on this side, it would be in my best interest and the best interest of the entire community and world to actually pay to stop polluting, to reduce my emissions through paying to stop that pollution, whether that's technological efficiency or changing my product design or something like that. On the left-hand side of the graph, at lower levels of pollution then, with this horizontal axis being pollution and then this vertical axis being cost, on the left-hand side, the cost of abating or stopping the pollution is greater than the cost to society. So in economic theory, we would say, it's cheaper to actually compensate society for the damage than it is to stop polluting. So this has certainly has some ethical, ethical questions to it, but the graph and the theory base gives us a point in the middle that's referred to as the social optimum level of pollution, that we wanna make sure that 
Uh, we are abating where we can. If there are levels of pollution where it's cheaper to compensate society and, and protect the environment in some way that, that reverses the damage, then it's better for us to do that than to pay the relatively more expensive abatement cost. Now, I want to acknowledge in saying this, there are clearly some ethical challenges in this, uh, and I'll deal with some of those in the next slide, but that's a very quick primer on pollution control economics and why markets and taxes for pollution control uh, function and are designed the way they are. But let me camp out here a little bit and take any questions about that whole concept of pollution control economics and the social optimum. What, what questions do you have about that theory base? Okay. So moving on, this is mostly a slide to refer to later. The problem is that that's economics in the, the theoretical world and economics actually functions in the real world. And so there are many shortcomings of that logic. First and foremost in economics, we're always assuming that everyone's a rational economic actor, everyone's rights are protected, everybody has complete information. Um, there's open negotiation of incentive mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, whether those are standards or taxes or uh, markets for controlling pollution. The critique would be that we actually don't have those conditions. So I'm going to do the rest of the presentation in full disclosure that while I work in carbon markets, I support carbon markets, I wholeheartedly believe that they're critically flawed and they can't be our only response to climate change. So I just want to make sure that that's put out there uh, right up front. It's, it's carbon markets are one of the most popular solutions to deal with climate change. They're uh, one of the most politically palatable and uh, the easiest to pass legislation in, in countries or jurisdictions where there might be controversy, but they're not the full extent of the solution set that we need to design. And that's because of the, the shortcomings of the theory base. I think we had a, a question from the previous slide. Um, yeah, good. You know, how things catch up. Um, Debbie asks, do these economics work in a state like New Mexico with a smaller population, smaller resources, things like that? Yeah, so in, so in the economic world, this theoretically works at every scale in every jurisdiction. Uh, but as uh, I'll be forthright with one of the principles of ecological economics is that all of economics as a science is flawed. It actually doesn't adhere to the laws of physics, uh, to the laws of nature and how the biotic world works, to, to ethical standards and uh, social justice and equity. So ecological economics, we say, sure, it, in theory it does, uh, but we need to make sure our implementation actually takes into consideration the social and environmental concerns that aren't addressed by this kind of theory. Does that answer the question? Yeah, great. Debbie, did you want to did you want to expand on that question? No, that's fine. I'll listen and see if I can learn some more. Thank you. Great. Thanks. That is the extent of the, uh, the policy wonk. I um, we're not going to talk a lot right now today on carbon taxes, but here's sort of a quick comparison between carbon market mechanisms and carbon tax mechanisms. I feel it's it's kind of my responsibility to give a little bit of framing of both, even though we're talking about markets today. Whereas carbon markets are control the quantity of pollution, they set a number of emission reduction permits, uh, they establish very clear targets for abating uh, emissions, and there's a floating market price. They incentivize abatement uh, at a controllable rate. So you can, for example, with climate change, we can control the rate at which greenhouse gas emissions are reducing a lot, you know, a lot more sensitive way with carbon markets. Uh, and they function in a way that actually encourages innovation, uh, which is really good for the business world and, and from a purely economic perspective. Carbon taxes, by comparison, then, are a price control mechanism. They set the rate of tax on all emissions, regardless of how much you're emitting. Uh, and it's usually not based on any specific tar targets for emissions reduction. So it's difficult to actually do a staged reduction of pollution using a tax mechanism. Uh, and they, but they do provide a certain amount of certainty on, on the income being used um, for, for pollution control mitigation. Uh, 
and they, they do shift capital from then the public sector to private sector to the public sector for allocation, which is beneficial from some perspectives. It can be problematic from other perspectives, uh, but they tend to provide a much more rigid structure that, that doesn't necessarily um, support innovation to develop new, new methods for managing pollution. What questions on those two policy approaches? Okay. And we can come back to questions too. The main reason I introduced this is every kind of pollution that we have will be managed either through a market mechanism, a tax mechanism, or in some cases, a fee, a flat fee-based mechanism. So on to emissions trading markets, or uh, we're going to be talking today mostly about carbon markets. These are often referred to as either tradable pollution permits or cap and trade systems or emission trading systems. Uh, I'll, I'll help to understand them in terms of cap and trade by explaining that there is a cap set through some uh, determination, some political process uh, in which we say, okay, this is the maximum pollution that's allowable across the industry or the jurisdiction that we're working with. And then uh, there's the creation of allowances. Every unit of pollution is, is uh, corresponds to an allowance and we slowly over time reduce the number of allowances in that system. So the emissions, get reduced because the number of uh, emission units that are allowed to happen in the system through those allowances that are issued are reduced over time. Uh, in some cases, there may then also be what are called offsets that are introduced to the system through other, through other means. So to use uh, carbon markets, we'd say, okay, well, we're looking at coal-fired power plants. Coal-fired power plants that are regulated using a cap and trade system would be given a certain number of allowances. And uh, they may or may not use all those allowances. Uh, if they want to continue emitting carbon into the atmosphere, they either need to have an allowance for each unit of, of emissions or purchase an, purchase an allowance from the market or purchase an offset from a farming or ranching project that might be outside of the industry that's being regulated. So that's why these are referred to cap and trade. There's an emissions cap and there's trading in the marketplace beneath that cap. But it's important to keep in mind that this is not a normal market in the way we think of markets. The only reason why pollution control markets or emission trading markets exist is because of the regulatory mandate. So that controls a lot of the dynamics of the marketplace and it doesn't function the way a normal a free or open market would function. There's a little bit of a of discussion in the chat you might want to check out and, and answer at this All point. All right, let me pull up my chat. We've got, um, or feel free folks who've been jumping in to unmute yourselves. Talia. So I'm seeing, how do we decide from Daniel? Yeah, how do we decide who gets to decide which companies are allowed to pollute and how much in a carbon market system? Great question. So that depends on the jurisdiction that's actually setting up the carbon market. If um, in the example of the United States, say the, the red, what's called the REGI or the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, a number of states have come together and determined the rules of that market. Those states will negotiate not only which industries are subject to regulation by that carbon market, but what scale the facilities in that in those industries uh, are regulated and what, what scale of facilities aren't. Uh, whether or not allowances are the only way the system works, if offsets are allowed to happen in the marketplace will be determined by that jurisdictional negotiation. Similarly, if a country creates uh, an uh, emissions trading system or for example, the EU, a coalition of countries, uh, that jurisdictional process and the regulatory policies that set up the market will determine who can pollute how much uh, and how the credits get, get um, distributed. So if it's based off of uh, history, wouldn't that create an adverse uh, incentive to start polluting a lot now before those yes. are implemented and then you get more credits that you can sell off? Absolutely. And not just starting pollution, but actually misreporting. And that's one of the reasons why the Kyoto Protocol broke down is there's an incentive in the industry at the beginning of an emissions trading market to overstate or pollute more so that you have more room 
uh, to reduce and, and uh, more leeway in that practice. So that is, you nailed one of the, one of the big flaws of emissions trading markets and carbon markets in particular. Over time, um, those patterns will work out of the system the longer it's been functioning and the more uh, third party verification there is uh, in the emissions dynamic. A uh, good question then from Debbie also about how to set up markets and trading with agricultural producers. Most agricultural uh, carbon then functions within the offset side of the market. So it depends on a market that is structured in a way that allows offsets. And I'll talk a little bit of later about the different uh, market types that there are. And then um, it depends on uh, how the accounting or the methodologies are done uh, for, for soil carbon and agricultural systems. So it, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but when I get to the, uh, the Paris climate agreement, you'll see that there's sort of an overarching way that uh, agricultural producers and forest managers can participate in the emerging global markets more easily, uh, regardless of the rules of each jurisdiction. I'm going to continue on. If there are any questions in the chat that are burning questions, um, I can catch up on them later. Or Eva, you can you can flag. Them yeah, there's one of uh, getting back to the models, um, working with models that are that are not applicable. Oh. How much funding does that eat up, and how much legislation does that affect? So it's we're getting um, right to the heart of things. Yeah. Yeah, this is another one of the flaws of carbon markets in general and, and pollution control economics. Uh, we talk about the transaction costs. Yeah, the, the amount that, uh, that's eaten up in terms of uh, getting the system set up and in particular with validation and verification of, of emissions and of offset emission changes, um, a significant amount. So if I'm to narrow that down and say, okay, if I'm a farmer or a rancher, and I'm changing how soil carbon works on, on in my um, agricultural operation and entering into the carbon market, currently about 60% of the value of that carbon is actually absorbed in validation and verification costs. So that the scientific process of making sure that, that there is a change in that carbon, documenting and getting ready for marketplace actually absorbs the vast majority of, of that value going into the market. It's a significant flaw in the carbon market. Again, it'll be worked out over time as, um, as the emissions caps are adjusted and as the price fluctuates. But that's one of the reasons why Regen Network Development actually works and why, why we've started to participate. Uh, we've created solutions where we can actually simplify that and reduce it to 20% uh, so that farmers and ranchers actually get the majority of the value from their credit sales and their project efforts. Great, and there was one more that came to me that I put back into the chat. Uh, other possible mechanisms besides tax and market have been suggested besides, and see, I don't know what this means, nuisance tort, uh, and markets are about property at base, what would be property interest created? Yeah, really good question. Um, I am not up to date on all the different options because I've been participating most in markets uh, these days. In, in terms of pollution control in general, there are fee-based mechanisms that are also used in some case, like um, that's more used for like non-point source pollution um, where there might be a per parcel fee for the impact that non-point source pollution has on, on water quality and roadway runoff. When it comes to carbon, one of the more prominent ones that's been discussed globally is what's called a cap and dividend system, where instead of cap and trading permits, there's a cap on emissions, there's a charge, um, and that charge actually then gets distributed to all, all beneficiaries of a stable climate. So essentially, everyone within the jurisdiction would receive a dividend uh, to compensate for the impacts of climate change. And that, that method, uh, that structure would tend to preserve social justice and equity a little bit more, uh, but it may not necessarily be the quickest way to, to reduce emissions. There are a lot of different solutions out there. And, and um, if, you, if you mention them in the chat, uh, or if mention them in, in a question a little bit later, I'll make sure to note down and sort of um, get up to date between now and next week on the ones that might be most significant. This is just a, a graphic visual then of that carbon market. I just wanted to note for folks that the primary core of a carbon market then is in the industry sector where the emissions are happening. And most of the trading is actually in those allowances uh, for the allocated greenhouse gas emissions units where uh, there may be on the right here an emitter B, 
may actually have reduced or not have a lot of emissions. They may have allowances or permits that they can sell then because they're not using them. And then it's the emitter on the left who's, who's emitting more than uh, what they were allocated or uh, more than what they estimated would act, have to purchase those. So the majority of carbon markets, when we're referring to them, is these compliance-based markets and the trading of allowances, especially, for example, in the EU emissions trading system. Offset credits then uh, will be an add-on to that system that exists in some jurisdictions, but not in others. I'm not going to go into this, but as you can imagine, there is a very complex regulatory structure in terms of how these markets work with the laws and regulations that establish them, the jurisdictional authorities that manage them, the independent third parties that are involved in validation and verification, the enterprises working in either uh, emissions reductions or offsetting, uh, and then the trading in the marketplace. So with all these complex dynamics, the value question was great these activities all cost actually. And so the, the cost and complexity of the system is definitely a burden to the effectiveness of emissions trading. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of a visual to understand all the dynamics in the, back, in the background. Brief history on how uh, emissions trading systems work. The first one was actually in the US for air quality. Uh, related to acid rain and then a creation of, of lead emissions trading systems and chlorofluorocarbon emissions trading systems. These are the ways in which we've actually learned that they work. We've been successful in reducing the impacts uh, and severity of acid rain uh, and also reducing uh, depletion of the ozone layer through emission of uh, chlorofluorocarbons, also emissions of lead. Um, due to emissions trading systems. So that's, that's why they're be so popular when it car comes to carbon is we've actually seen the success of these in other pollution control contexts. It wasn't until the 2000s that were, there were international greenhouse gas emissions trading systems. And then uh, since 2010, we've been seeing a lot more action with the Paris Agreement. Quick map to show you just around the world where there are carbon markets, where there are tax systems. Uh, so you can refer back to this. This is actually regularly updated because it's changing very quickly. Uh, the World Bank keeps their carbon pricing dashboard uh, where emissions trading systems exist in the green colored countries, taxes in the uh, sort of blue or purple. And then um, there will be a system under consideration in the yellow ones. Uh, and then there's um, implementation or scheduled uh, creation of systems in the countries that are striped. So as you look at this, we can see most of the countries in the world are actually moving towards uh, a, a market-based system, a carbon market for emissions control. Some are doing taxes, but market is definitely the most prominent. And then a quick overview of from the enterprise scale, some of the, the reasons why. Some, some countries, because not it's not just uh, companies excuse me, companies uh, that are in the energy sector that are required to participate in carbon markets that are participating. Some are doing it just to change, uh, change internal behavior, drive efficiency. Uh, some are doing it uh, for brand awareness. Some are certainly doing it for uh, regulatory compliance. A lot are, do a lot are engaging, uh, like Microsoft, for example, is engaging in carbon markets because there's, it's an expectation of their consumers and their stakeholders. Um, so there are a variety of different reasons why, why companies are participating. It looks like this might have been there. answered. Yeah, it might have been answered, but are there very many oil and gas companies involved in carbon trading yet? There are, and, and, and let me actually introduce a little bit of an anecdote there. Not only are they involved in carbon trading, but most oil and gas companies now are putting a price on carbon internally in their decision-making whether or not they're required to. Uh, so we're at a point now where it's such a significant challenge, climate change that we're facing, whether or not they're working in a jurisdiction that does require them to participate in, in an emissions trading market. Um, most oil and gas companies are including a carbon price in their financial accounting. And so they're looking at it from a risk management perspective, either anticipating that they will have to comply with a carbon market in the future, or just simply because they know it has uh, a variety of other uh, risk impacts on their, their business operations. And it's curious because when we look at, say, uh, Total, BP, uh, some of the other companies that are in oil and gas, they're actually using often a carbon price of $30 per ton. Uh, 
uh, as opposed to the EU ETS, which is the, the main marker we use for price globally, is trading at about 20, 25, 25 to 27. Agricultural carbon markets are often functioning, uh, or urban, uh, agricultural carbon offsets are selling somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 per ton on up to $15 per ton. Uh, but oil and gas companies are tending to use $30 a ton for their internal risk analysis, even if they're not subject to regulation. The Kyoto Protocol was the first international treaty. Uh, there are a lot of flaws in how it actually functioned. It was a mandatory treaty uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It was signed on by uh, 38 industrialized countries. I think 55 signed eventually, um, and it accounted for the majority of the emissions. The challenge with the Kyoto Protocol, as you can see in the map here, a couple really prominent countries ratified it but withdrew or uh, signed it and didn't ratify it with, with legislation uh, that would support it. Uh, China and uh, 100 developing nations were actually exempted from the mandatory targets. And then uh, Russia actually signed and ratified, but I believe didn't reach their, their emissions goals that, that were required. So essentially the Kyoto Protocol uh, failed in terms of uh, being functionally effective uh, to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions globally because of these challenges in implementation and then also uh, some of the challenges that uh, occurred in supply and demand. Uh, to the question earlier about uh, over emitting or as I mentioned over reporting, a lot of countries over reported their emissions so that they had um, too much room to reduce and actually the markets that were created out of Kyoto Protocol uh, ended up having too much supply and not enough demand as a result so the carbon price collapsed and the whole system, the whole system broke down. The Paris Agreement is um, the treaty that, that we have right now. It's a voluntary international agreement setting a, a temperature target instead of a, an emissions target. And each country sets up their own target of uh, what, what they call nationally determined contributions to that. Every five years, each country committing to the Paris Agreement then will look at uh, our current state when it comes to climate change and adjust their NDC targets. So, so it's a much more dynamic mechanism in that it is voluntary, but every five years at the Council of the Parties and the, uh, in the Climate Summit negotiations, they adjust. And we're actually in, in the process of a five-year adjustment right now in 2020 with, with the full force implementation of the Paris Agreement. Article six of the Paris Agreement sets up the, the structures for international trading, uh, what are called internationally tradable mitigation outcomes. And then article nine includes other mechanisms uh, that allow countries to implement and, and meet their targets while still supporting uh, less developed nations that might need more, more assistance. And so here's a quick comparison. I'll camp out on this comparison for any questions about the treaties. This just gives a little bit of overview uh, between, the, between the two treaties as a comparison of why they might be more or less effective. But what, what questions do you have about the, the international treaties setting these markets up? Any questions? Okay. So moving on to the heart of our talk today Carbon market types, there are three major types that I like to use to classify. Uh, two, or, two are commonly referred to. I included one just as an informal reference. I've talked a lot about compliance-based markets, uh, those industries that are being regulated that have to, by law, reduce their emissions and engage in a carbon market. So these are by far the, the largest and most prominent markets in the world, such as the European uh, Union emissions trading systems or uh, the regional greenhouse gas initiative in, in the United States among states uh, and various other mechanisms. So these have uh, certified emissions reductions where the industries are required to engage in the marketplace. Uh, and it's a, a regulatory compliance, a mandatory system when we get to agricultural carbon and soil carbon, though, these uh, any markets that people are participating in with agricultural carbon tend to be in the category of voluntary markets. Um, although in this case it would be formally structured voluntary markets where you engage in a project, um, you reduce emissions or you, you increase the amount of carbon that the soil is taking up. You go through a process of verifying those 
with a protocol or methodology that measures it and a third party verifier or validator. Uh, and then you can sell that on the market. In many cases, those, uh, those entities that are purchasing from these carbon markets are not regulated uh, companies or industries. So Microsoft, for example, is one of the largest purchasers uh, internationally on the voluntary markets. Depending on the system, some of the regulated industries, energy industries in particular, may actually be able to purchase from the voluntary market and, and purchase offsets, but, but not always. And so these standards are often coming out of uh, the VERA or the Verified Carbon Standard or Gold Standard uh, or other jurisdictional systems that are setting up these voluntary systems. And then I included a category also for um, voluntary markets and offsets that are more informal. These would be uh, credit systems that aren't certified or verified, pay for performance programs that are more project oriented that may not be measured per unit of carbon, white label credits that a company might originate themselves or, or what's called insetting where they may actually offset their operational emissions through changing the supply chain and getting farmers and ranchers that they purchase from to change their practices as a way to reduce their scope one or scope two emissions um, through, through changes in the scope three emissions. Uh, and so these, the voluntary markets, uh, informal and formal are actually uh, the fastest, fastest expanding and the easiest to access for agricultural uh, participants who wanna engage with soil carbon. What questions do you have about those carbon, the market types? Because this is, now we're getting sort of into the heart of how the markets work and how agricultural carbon farmers or ranchers might, might engage. Are there any questions that come up from, from background or work that you folks do that might uh, get into which, which market would we participate in? Or um, can I tell you more about markets that you might've learned about that you have access to? Well, one question was, um, is anyone measuring carbon in soil in New Mexico or Colorado, which would get at a couple of, which would be the, you know, the baseline for a couple of these? Yeah. So the good news is um, the choice to engage in the marketplace, it actually doesn't matter if there's a market within your jurisdiction. And so this is the beauty of um, the way the Paris Agreement is set up and the way the voluntary markets function. So I'll go back to this slide. Uh, when it comes to agricultural carbon, if I'm interested in changing my farming practices or my grazing practices and uh, capturing more carbon and keeping it in the soil, there are standards developed by uh, VERA, the Verified Carbon Standard or Gold Standard or Regen Network. We actually develop our own standards where you can engage in a project and participate in the carbon market even if you're not in a jurisdiction that, that uh, has a carbon market established by regulatory, man, by regulatory um, legislation, uh, whether that's mandatory or voluntary. So that's the beauty of voluntary markets is you don't need to be in a jurisdiction that's explicitly designated as a carbon market jurisdiction in order to participate. And the way the Paris Agreement works actually, most of the trading will be through what are the, called these internationally tradable mitigation outcomes or ITMOs, where you can actually trade internationally. In the case of Regen Network Development, we work, uh, our first projects have been with ranchers in Australia who are changing to rotational grazing practices, shifting how much carbon is in their soil. And then we've actually be, been selling to uh, our first large scale buyer as a corporation uh, a pretty well-known name that I can't announce yet. We'll, we'll have the news coming out in the next month or two here. Uh, that's a U.S. corporation. So um, in soil agricultural carbon, if you're in New Mexico, for example, uh, you can have the opportunity to access markets and engage in those markets regardless of whether there is a market in your jurisdiction. So what you would do is look for uh, somebody who is developing or somebody who is a marketplace like Regen Network or Nori is another example, uh, or go through the, the carbon standards that are out there to find a standard or a protocol or a program that would work for the, the best management practices that you have in mind, and then look into what it would take to get that project started. And we can talk later in this session, and then also, in the, especially in the second session, we can actually get into the nuts and bolts of how that, how that would work. Uh, how you would engage in measurement and how you can look at your practices now and assess if it might be a good option for you or for stakeholders you yeah, work Yeah, there's with. a couple of uh, pretty uh, specific questions in the chat, but I 
think when we talked about it, I think you're going to get to some of this. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask that we hold off on some of these more specific ones. Um, okay. But maybe the, this one is related to this slide we're looking at right now. Does the gold standard or VCS have standards for measurement? So yeah, the, the, what are called protocols or methodologies, each one of these entities will actually develop a protocol or a methodology that does specify how to assess or measure. Uh, that's something that we at Regen Network Development are doing also. Uh, we of course feel like our, our method is more innovative and flexible than, than the other ones. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit of, at, a, at a high level of, of how we work. Uh, but each of the entities that either is a, um, certifies a standard uh, or actually engages in a registry or exchange such as Regen Network, will have a methodology or a protocol that explains what activities are included, how those get measured, uh, and how you find verifiers or validators to work with you in that process. A couple of quick questions for you, James. Um, one is, is there some merit in developing your own standard authentically, given some of the sensitivities that exist? Is there examples of communities or states developing an, their own uh, market, for example? And then a, a follow-up question is, have you heard of Jim Blackburn from Rice University and what do you think of the work he's doing in this area? Uh, let me deal with the second one first. I have not. I've not been paying a lot of attention to the academic literature, so I would welcome any references that that's would help the, me. Um, that's the Baker group that I was telling you okay. about literally an hour ago. That. <laughs> so, Do you want to jump in with a comment on that, Eva? Um, I, I've been in the, I've been on the metrics subgroup for that um, development, um, but we haven't been looking across, like comparing across things so I don't we we can definitely tuck that in the way or a way for addressing it next week so yeah yeah it's a, it's a great question and and um, I think what we're realizing even just now in the first month of uh, 2021 that this is actually the heart of where the markets are, are going to be going I for me this is the most exciting realm is where we're looking at projects or credits that do have a customized flavor or, or a bespoke design, we might call it, uh, where an entity or a jurisdiction is actually saying, hey, we've got a project or we've got a stakeholder group or we've got a land management ethic that is so unique, it actually doesn't fit into an existing standard. In the case of regen network development, you can use our standard for some pieces and then add in pieces of your own uh, for something that, that is more customized. But it's, this is very significant this year in particular because what we're seeing is in the voluntary market, the prices are starting to change depending on all the other things uh, that, that um, might characterize a particular project. So that would be where the project is in geographic location, how big it is, uh, what year or vintage it is, but in particular, what are called uh, co-benefits or, or additional attributes. The co-benefits speak to uh, maybe there are social or environmental goals from the UN Sustainable Development Goals that are aligned with your organization's uh, or, or your agricultural operations way of working or your ethics. Maybe there is a land ethics statement from, uh, from an indigenous community in New Mexico that you want to include and look at how your carbon management is affected, affects or is affected by that particular indigenous land management ethic. These realms of what are called additional attributes or co-benefits are more and more becoming an integral part of the, the quality of the carbon being sold on markets. And there's actually a really big price variation now where a recent report from the ecosystem uh, marketplace shows that while a, the average price for soil organic carbon on the market right now is somewhere in the realm of two to five dollars per ton. Uh, when you look at custom, custom methodologies or custom protocols that have a greater emphasis on these co-benefits or additional attributes, the price can go up to um, seven, 10, even, even 12 or $14. Um, so it's really that quality of carbon and the other environmental and social dynamics that, uh, that are associated with the carbon that are, that are more and more becoming an integral part of the value proposition of, of engaging in the carbon market. I just want to do a quick time check. We have about 20 more minutes together. 
Um, yeah, so maybe uh, about five or six or seven more minutes of slides and then uh, we got lots of questions and I'll just let you all know that I'm putting, I'm saving the chat. And so um, Good. Jim and I can uh, exchange and strategize for what things we want to address next week. And of course, you know, I'll send emails and invite y'all to ask more questions uh, by email. So um, we, we'll, we'll try to get to all these questions, but I just wanted to give you a time check of, of how much more you want to cover today. Thanks. Yeah, what I'll probably do is I'll probably get into the sum of details of region network development, our methodology, and then a lot more discussion in the next session. So I'll save some of the, the latter slides and just present a couple more here. We're talking about different types of carbon projects. I wanted to give you a sense of how diverse they are. So here's, here's a graph that shows all the different types of carbon projects that are, that are commonly being um, transacted in, uh, as offsets in the carbon market. Those that uh, are highlighted in, in sort of a, looks like it's a weird mustard yellow, it's the ch color has changed here, uh, are agricultural related carbon uh, projects. And those that are in the red circles are actually the ones that we at Regen Network Development are focusing on first. You can tell by the width of these bars uh, what the ab abatement potential is in terms of um, the tons of greenhouse gas em of, of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas emissions per year. And then uh, the, the vertical or y-axis is the abatement cost. So the wider blocks are the ones that have a lot more uh, global warming potential in terms of the impact in that area of uh, carbon offset. And then the taller ones uh, over here are, are more expensive, or in this case, actually have higher cost savings through implementation. Uh, so there's a wide variety of practice, best management practices, be it no-till agriculture or rotational grazing uh, or organic soil restoration uh, that can be engaged in. If you're interested in honing in on any of these, um, I'd invite you to, to look back at this slide and we can talk about any of these in particular and how they would, how they might pertain to your questions or, or your operation or projects. This is a little bit better focus on the natural climate solutions or nature-based pathways. A um, little easier to read than the graph and the potential for various biotic uh, carbon projects. And then this also provides a bit more information than on natural climate solutions. So we can see that reforestation or avoided forest conversion, forest management actually have the greatest potential. Uh, although that gets into a lot more policy dynamics when it comes to uh, forest management and, and can be more difficult to implement. Uh, and then agricultural uh, forms of carbon actually have very significant um, global warming potential as well. And in, in these colored dots, you can actually see a designation of some of the co-benefits or uh, going back to the beginning of the presentation, the connection to other ecosystem services. And that's, that's what we're most excited about at, at Regen Network Development is not just working on carbon, is actually working on water scarcity and water quality issues and some of the other environmental and social challenges we're having through, um, through the entry point of carbon and, and these other ecosystem service markets through the co-benefits work. Quick, quickly on the water issue, I, I was just wondering if you've heard of the, from healthy soil principles, there's a known benefit that is better, greater water infiltration. Yes. And when, and when there's more water infiltration, uh, in water in the ground, I, I understand that that potentially could attract carbon itself in the ground is the water level. Is that true? Absolutely. And I think this is this is the wonder of where we're going to see uh, climate science, in particular, uh, soil carbon science going in the future is uh, we're taking a very linear and, and direct causal um, view of carbon when we're when we're putting agricultural carbon projects into the marketplace. Now, when you get into those broader co benefits that soil health not only increases carbon sequestration, it actually improves the um, the vascular and metabolic function of the plants, it actually uh, improves the working on soil health, improves the biodiversity of the, the microbiome in the soil. 
it ma massively improves water infiltration. Uh, and all of those benefits then can have a follow-on benefit of again increasing carbon. This is why we, uh, that's this is why our company is called the Regen Network. It's that regenerative effect of not just the direct causal impact of our actions, uh, but the um, the on the follow-on effect and the the more complex effect that soil carbon and soil health affecting water infiltration that in turn affects carbon sequestration. This is what we're most excited about. And so we're developing a platform uh, that can, can handle the kind of science complexity uh, that's necessary to engage all these co-benefits in a much accurate accounting system uh, for, for project originators, for farmers and ranchers to engage in the carbon market. The accounting isn't very sophisticated in the yet in the effect that you're talking about, uh, but but we're really hoping that uh, that that science expands very rapidly because there's strong potential there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let me camp out there. I can I'll, I'll give you the intro of uh, Regen Network. Uh, in the next session and, and our solutions. But let me just pause there and we can catch up on questions from the chat or any questions people have on the top of their head. Eva, do you have highlights from the chat that you wanna call out? And yeah, there's a couple. Um, so let's see, coming all the way back up here. Um, carbon credits are for private l land or ranches only or is public land um, also able to be included? Yeah, public land can be included, really anything. Uh, once we're getting into the more complex voluntary markets right now, uh, anybody who changes their land management practices can engage in a carbon market. On public land, um, it would be a little more difficult because you would need to go through uh, the necessary public review and, and um, policy development in order to support that engagement and participation. Uh, I think increasingly we're going to see that as, as just a common practice of, of land management agencies in the public sector. Uh, so the process of entry can be a little bit more complex and decision making than, than in the private sector, but it, it certainly is possible. Great, and then we had um, one to me that was, how do landowners plug into project partners and consultants to get credits verified and things like that, which I think you may go into using Regen as an example. Yeah, why not? I could actually give a really quick spin on these, on these slides because these are way simpler. Um, well, let me just say, I'll answer that one narratively. We'll dive into that one in a lot more detail in the next session. Uh, basically, you would need to find either a, a a certifier of a methodology or a protocol like a, a gold standard or a, a verified carbon standard VCS, uh, which is run by Vera. Uh, or we would just recommend working with like a company like ourselves. And, and just for full balanced presentation, I'll say uh, Regen Network Development is not the only entity out there that's working to provide farmers and, and ranchers um, and other land managers with access. So Nori is another one that, that uh, is one of our former partners. We're really excited about what they're doing. Uh, more and more, there are different entities that are working to provide easy access. It's important to look though uh, at what, what price are they willing to pay for carbon? Are they willing to uh, provide investment prior to implementation of the project in, in what's called ex ante funding as a, or just ex post funding? Uh, so there's a bit of possibility of risk sharing. Uh, do they have a flexible standard? Is it something where we can uh, use their methodology and add the particular co-benefits or additional attributes that are unique to our organization for for uh, uh, a custom uh, engagement in the carbon market so that we might be able to get a bit of a higher price. So it's good to be very, um, to inquire quite a bit about how their program works and, and you know, compare different entities. But uh, for those who are interested, I'm, I'm always happy to share more about Regen Network outside of this presentation to, to see what, you know, what might be um, some of the opportunities available to your particular entity. Uh, but I would say, you know, look around, um, there, there are quite a few out there and, and Google searches will help you help you to find and there's a lot in the news. There were a couple coming back, um, you know, getting into some contentious things that um, doesn't Good. seem fair when some of worst polluting countries are exempt from treaties. And then is there evidence that 
tyrant regimes will enter into treaties in good faith. So this is zooming back out to that, that global scale. We had a couple of questions at that scale. Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so the challenge of engagement in the treaties is, is significant. Uh, what we're seeing increasingly, though, is that the international, com inter international community has a consensus that uh, climate action is very urgent and it's affecting the economy. So um, even those, uh, those countries that we might have ethical issues with have a motivation to participate because there's an economic incentive. And for example, by, by changing their land use practices and participating in, in carbon markets or, or potentially by um, structuring a system whereby they can they can reduce emissions in their energy industry faster than the rest of the world. They can actually export carbon credits out of their country and have a significant export uh, uh, export value increase to their country. So, um, even though there are sort of ethical questions with certain countries, I think the economic and social motivation is increasingly in support of every nation uh, participating. The Paris Agreement, though, uh, sort of shifted things around and that it's a voluntary commitment. So transparency is, is an absolutely critical aspect when it comes to the Paris Agreement. Uh, there are organizations like Environmental Defense Fund, though, for example, who have uh, put up satellites that can measure, uh, in their case, methane emissions from space. And so there's, there's uh, greater and greater transparency of being able to look at CO2 emissions and methane emissions uh, with remote sensing so that we can actually see a country or a facility's emissions and actually double check their reporting as well. So that's, it, it's, you can sort of get, get around some of the corruption issues uh, with the power of science.